evening, I should say, or good afternoon. I'm delighted to be part of this great event celebrating 50 years of our um, victory, shall we say, over evil. And uh, I'm even more happy to be able to discuss this momentous, dramatic event with a person of amongst our colleagues who's alive, another very old friend of almost half a century, uh, Mr. Sati Lamba, who was in the thick of it as a young officer during the 1971 war and the run up to it in the America's division, which was crucial as you know, and as will appear in the course of our conversation this afternoon. He was also very deeply involved with Pakistan all through his career, having served there on at least three occasions, uh, both in headquarters and finally as high commissioner uh, in uh, Islamabad and in the, on the desk <clears throat> in Delhi, including during the days when I was consul general in Karachi, he was in charge of the Pakistan desk in Delhi. So uh, there are very few people left alive who know this subject better than Sati Lamba. So I'm delighted to have him as a part of this important conversation. Um, if I may begin, Sati, with the, uh, with the effect of the Sheikh Mujibur Rahman Awami League victory in the election of 17 December 1917, when he and his Awami League won a majority in what was then the Pakistan National Assembly. And thereafter, if we can go straight on to the next issue, which is what were Mujib's demands to the Pakistan uh, president, that time it was Yahya Khan, and to the leader of the other opposition party, which was the People's Party of Pakistan, headed by Zulfiqar. <clears throat> what was the effect of Mujib's victory, number one, and what were the considerations or the, 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 the conditions that he laid down for joining the National Assembly convened for March 1971. Please, Sadi, the floor is yours. Thank you, Avtab. Well, I'm grateful to Raja Malvinder Singh and the veterans of Patala for having brought me back to 1971. And I'm grateful to them that they have asked a man of the reputation of Aftab Seth to interview me, who has a background of everything. And besides, we have a friendship of over five or six decades. So that will help us in giving to the viewers the best possible that we are capable of. Uh, I'll come straight to Aftab's question. That is the effect of Sheikh Mujibur Rahman's win in the National Assembly. I think the victory of Sheikh Mujibur Rahman in the 1970 December elections was a turning point in the history of the subcontinent. He secured 160 out of the 162 seats in East Pakistan, the then East Pakistan, thus giving him a majority in the overall house of 300. Whereas Bhutto was able to get only 81 out of 140 seats. The, the, now the next step was that uh, Yaya was playing his dramatics. He described Mujib as a, a future prime minister and suddenly announced that uh, the session is being suspended. Uh, now that there was criticism in West Pakistan and anger in East Pakistan at this decision. Not used to democratic traditions, Bhutto at that time said that, I think it was on the 20th of December, he said that merely getting a majority is not enough. What he was trying to emphasize was that Sindh and, Pakistan and Punjab were more important. Mm. 
it is very interesting what was the Indian reaction at that time. But before that, the U.S., as in the declassified telegrams, it now uh, appears, the, described this event, their consul general in New York described this, uh, sorry, in, uh, in Dhaka, described the suspension of uh, the National Assembly as the beginning of the breakup of Pakistan. Mm. That's you know, so it is something for, mm. as far as India is concerned, we, we, you know, at that stage, India was fighting for the democratic rights of the people of Pakistan. The Prime That's Minister, right. the then Prime Minister, Mrs. Indra Gandhi, in her speech, said that what we would like is that the results of the election should be respected. And then we come to the next question, which Aftab has added, Mujib's demand for participating in the National Assembly. You That's see, right. Mujib was bound to the six-point agenda, and I won't repeat that here because we all know it. But in his speech, uh, uh, Dhaka, at the Ramna race course on 7th March, he made four conditions for, the, uh, for participation in the National Assembly. One, the immediate lifting of the, the martial law. Two, the withdrawal of all military personnel to their barracks. Three, immediate transfer of power to the elected people. And four, a proper inquiry into the loss of life during the conflict. This was not all. You know, his speech, which I've spoken to many people when I went to open the mission uh, at Ramna, lasted 19 minutes, but was electrifying. And it ended with the words, the struggle this time is a struggle for independence. Joy Bangla. Joy Bangla. Yes. I yes. yes. <clears throat> now, what happened, Aftab, was that a few days later he met Yaya. And being a practical man, Mujib came with some further, uh, uh, res you know, removed some restrictions on Pakistan. And uh, he said that he could attend the meeting of the National Assembly provided three conditions were met. One, appointment of an East Pakistan governor selected by the Awami League, which had won majority in that area. Two, lifting of the martial law. And three, an interim constitution to be framed, incorporating the six points and the, as is, he tried to please Jaya, he said they could be the president could continue at the center. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so this yeah. is these were the conditions. That's Obviously, right. now I want to add here something. Jaya was playing tricks with Mujib. You know, whereas he was meeting him and a delegation from West Pakistan led by Sadar Shokat Hayat had arrived. And with great difficulty, they could meet him alone, not with Mujib. And, you know, Shokat Hayat has written a book, A Nation That Lost Its Soul. And he gifted me a copy of the book just before I left Islamabad. But I read it years later. And in that book, he mentions that at midnight when they met the president of Pakistan, he had a towel on his head, a drink in his hand, and was still promising them that he will try to meet Mujib, whereas he had decided not to meet him. Yes. You know, if you read, <laughs> if you read uh, Niazi's book, and Niazi quotes Mujib telling him on the 18th, uh, days before all this, that the bastard is not behaving, catch him. So he had no. already, as the chief martial law administrator, issued instruction to Niazi to hold him. So these mm -hmm. were all just a farce. I That's hope I've given you a top and yes, the viewers an mm -hmm. idea of what the situation was at that time. Quite right. And then after this, obviously, uh, instructions were given to Niazi to arrest Mujib, and um, he was sent off to prison in uh, West Pakistan. And uh, martial law in East Pakistan continued. And then began the infamous Operation Searchlight, 
under Niazi's um, control and I think he was replaced by General Tikha Khan, wasn't he at some stage? Or Tikha Khan was uh, certainly involved in the, in the brutalities that were then perpetrated yeah. from March onwards uh, on the civilian population of, um, of East Pakistan amongst the Bengalis or non-Bengali population, civilian population of Pakistan. The enslavement of thousands of women into sexual slavery and uh, all manner of, of um, atrocities, particularly against the intellectuals. You remember the, the killings in Dhaka University where the attempt was to obliterate uh, from memory the Bengali uh, intellectual elite who was supporting Mujib and his demands for independence. Now, in your view, and since you were looking after the America's division, wasn't it a case that, as you said, the Consul General in Dhaka himself signaled that this would be the end of Pakistan as a single state? The American press also, to the best of my memory, were very supportive of what we were trying to do in East Pakistan. But the, uh, the barbaric activities uh, <clears throat> were unnoticed by the leadership of uh, the United States, that is Nixon and Henry Kissinger. Now tell me, in your opinion, sitting here as you were at the America's desk, was it clear to the world at large that a genocide of sorts was being perpetrated by the West Pakistani troops? Well, this was a time, well, there's an advantage of being interviewed by a man who knows the background. So Aftab has, in asking a question, also answered part of it. So it makes it easy for me. Now, you know, the, the, it was an act of genocide and barbarism. The question answers the question, yes. It was extremely, the, the, the uh, authorities in West Pakistan had established this with a view to curb Bengali nationalist movement in the East, you know, and they succeeded in the first few weeks. You know, the, the last Bengali uh, stronghold was taken over in May, as you know, but what they had not realized was that Operation Searchlight would encourage the people of Bangladesh, the future Bangladesh, to, to with, fight with more enthusiasm because at the same time, there was more progress with the Mukti Bayani and the Indian Army getting together. And that will come later when there are other questions uh, asked. The, yes. So, oppression, yes, in brief, oppression search light was the basis of the, the Bangladesh freedom struggle for the next few months. It encouraged them. Quite right. And I think that's when it began, was the exodus of Bengali serving in Pakistani missions abroad, as the atrocities kept, kept coming to light. And I was in Tokyo, by the way, at that time, and the first defections of Bengali diplomats serving in the Pakistan embassy took place in Tokyo. And there were two officers, Masood, the press attaché, and a young third secretary, Khamar Rahim, who were the first to defect and seek refuge in the Indian embassy. And we were instructed, of course, to look after them and give them every possible help. But this was the beginning, as you say, Sati, of the unraveling of Pakistan. And that's where you, in the MEA, as you were posted then, under the command and liberation, the inspired leadership of Indira Gandhi, our prime minister, that you started your diplomatic efforts to try and convince the world of the justice of what we were trying to do, which is to bring uh, liberation to the people, the oppressed people of East Pakistan, which later became Bangladesh. You were part of that and as you know, the Prime Minister herself traveled abroad. Did you accompany her 
on her visit to the United States where she was treated very badly by Nixon and Kissinger? Well, uh, good. I'll take you to this journey, this great journey of Mrs. Gandhi. To the, but before that, India faced, we have to notice, note one thing, that in those early days, India faced many difficulties. There was, of course, uh, sympathy for us because of the refugees. That's but right. 10 million of them. Because of this <laughs> principle, principle of sovereignty and to that the states should not be disrupted. Right. Many of the smaller countries in Africa and in uh, Latin America were not willing to vote for us. Right. We had to be prepared for this. And that is one point that P. N. Huxer, who had been a former ambassador to Nigeria and yes. had seen Biafra yes. in a note. Uh, excuse me, was, was P. N. Huxer then secretary to the prime minister? He was secretary to the prime secretary minister, the prime minister. Yes, and he yes. had sent a note to her. He yes. had sent a note to her that we must prepare for these things uh, beforehand. Uh, you mean and, prepare for the fact that African and, and Latin American tribes? You know, so that is the time when delegations started, you mentioned, to Tokyo, to West Europe, and all over the world delegations were sent. In yes. fact, the first time power to delegation was Sadat Swaran Singh as foreign minister going yes. to the the countries in West Europe, he was able to get support from President Pompidou and mm. Prime Minister Heath, uh, and he carried on with his uh, trip and came back. Though uh, in America, he didn't, you know, they tried to misguide him, as a mm. recent book has revealed. Mm. Who tried to misguide so, him? Did you know, then after Sadat Swaran Singh uh, visit, Mrs. Gandhi still felt that the West was, the response, as she said, to Parliament was tardy, T-A-R-D-Y. Yes. And she decided to herself go to Belgium, France, UK, Germany, and the uh, USA. It's yes. very interesting that to each country she went, she mentioned something that would be of interest to them speaking at the Royal Belgian Institute uh, in Belgium, she reminded them that the number of number of uh, refugees in India is equivalent to the population of Belgium. <laughs> uh, I'm told by some people there it had a great impact, this one statement. You know, yeah. that they realized that, you know, the just that it was problem. not enough to tell them. Yeah. Then, she went to UK, to Germany. Ch Chancellor Brandt wrote to Yaya to release Mujib. President Pompidou in France. Uh, France similarly wrote. And her trip went off very well. And her, especially her remarks in, at public forums and to the media, they got great support. Mm. US of course, was a different cup of tea. Sorry, see, what, about US, UK? what about UK, Sati, before you get to US? Well, well in UK, Heath was uh, uh, helpful. Ah, you know, good. he also wrote that uh, um, we, we must, uh, he wrote to Yaya that uh, he must release Mujib. Right, right, right. Now, we come to, you know, US. U.S. The U.S. In U.S., it was one man versus the rest. It was to anything. If Kissinger is presiding over a meeting and the State Department is saying that, see, we must do something to support India, he says, this will go against what the, you know, hinted to them, the president will not allow anything against Jaya. Right. Uh, so there's a man called Johnson, Deputy Secretary of State in the U.S. State Department. He came out with a very good statement at an interministerial meeting presided by Kissinger that this is the time we must accept some what India is saying, yes. but was overruled because, as Kissinger hints, and because of he knew that Jaya he will not permit. Uh, uh, right. At the same time. I would like to refer to the Kissinger visit. 
Kissinger came to India on July 6, and uh, I received him along with my joint secretary at the airport because both P.N. Haksar and T.N. Call thought it was not necessary for them to go to the airport. He was so, National Security Advisor. Yes. So there was a, he had many meetings. He met the prime minister. He met the defense minister. He met the external affairs minister. And with each one, the meetings were conducted. Uh, I was present at the last lunch foreign secretary call hosted for him. And uh, we were sitting in the, I, naturally as a junior most member, I was sitting in the corner and with me, Aftab, I forget this name of this American who later became ambassador to China. I think his wife was Chinese. Anyhow, see, he was sitting with me. And Not suddenly... Rafael. Rafael. Not huh? Rafael. Not Rafael. No. Rafael. And then, no. then, you know, suddenly hmm. we ran short of conversation and I said, how are your relations with China? You know, I saw him sweating. And... <laughs> As you will recall, TN called always to green chilies with his lunch. Right. So I called the waiter. I said, have you served him by mistake a green chili? He said, no, sir. We only give it to you because I also used to take a green chili uh, to no one else. Huh? Three days later, when Kissinger is Beijing, I rushed to TN calls room and mentioned this part of the conversation yes. to him. Because at that time, yes. There was no need to tell him that he was swear. They were didn't want they anything from China. They were worried That's if he had it. And, Anyhow, and Kissinger begun his secret visits to Beijing via Islamabad at by that stage. Were those secret well, you visits? Know, I will not bother the veterans and all of you with the details of the Kissinger visit, but uh, neither of Kissinger's visit to China and it is the report from China after the visit with turntables. You know, when he was in Delhi, Kissinger told us that if China attacked, uh, helped Pakistan in an attack in India, or directly attacked, we will help you. On return, he changed it. He <laughs> said, not if they helped Pakistan. And that was on the 16th of July. I remember the day because it's my birthday. And, nice. and we were in the America's desk, you know, trying to, we didn't have full information, which is now available in the telegram because these must be very top secret telegrams. They didn't come down, you know, charged telegrams and all. But uh, now they are out in Shekhar's book. That's and right. uh, with, with great clarity, Chandrasekhar Das Gupta's book. Yes. So that was and happening then. Now, what happens is, I tell you, an important event took place. This was 16 July. And on Mrs. Gandhi was having some thoughts on the Indo-Soviet Treaty. Must have given her clearance during these days. Because 9th August, Gromyko and Swaran Singh signed the Indo-Pakistan, the indo Russian Treaty of Friendship yes. with Article 9, which in the draft was earlier shown as Article 6 and other. Now, this was a turning point That's in right. what we are discussing. But I will mm -hmm. overlook this and come to another aspect and can, before I conclude. Mrs. Gandhi very skillfully, Aftab and the veterans, I want to tell you here as you're listening to me, that has very skillfully kept the people of India, the Indian parliament, the opposition and the international community informed of what was happening. And I am going to read out to you six or seven text headings of six or seven of her speeches on that day. And please note the dates. The danger India faces, Rajya Sabha, March 27. The need for resolution of East Bengal, March 31, both houses of parliament. Colossal burden on India, Lok Sabha, March 21. Victim of terror to the Italian TV team on June 15. Secret trial of Sheikh Mujib, August 10, 71. She warned all world leaders that they're secretly going to try him. 
and don't allow that to happen. Need for a democratic solution. At a lunch hosted by Chairman Kosygin in Moscow, when she went to Moscow as a part of the same efforts, and when the treaty was made, she still spoke of the democratic relations of the people of Pakistan and hope that they will be fulfilled. Right. Then India will India will stand on its own feet. Newsweek, November 15. And finally, the truth about Bangladesh. This is a speech she delivered in Jaipur in Hindi, which is worth reading just before. And finally, India recognizes Bangladesh, December 6. Why I'm mentioning these all is that this was to keep the people of India, to keep the opposition, to keep parliament, and to keep the international community regularly informed, in addition to delegations and other things. Yes. So now, you have uh, rightly mentioned, Sati, the turning point of the Indo-Soviet Treaty of August 1971. But I understand from Shekhar's book and other sources that while the Soviets uh, undertook to help us in the event of military conflict, it was not till November of that year that they agreed to assist us in the Security Council and to block any veto or any efforts by the Americans to stop Indian activity, military activity, if it ever took place. Is that correct? That while the treaty it was is correct, August, it, is, it, is, it is correct to some extent to what you are saying dealing with East, East Bengal. East Bengal. They were, at the same time, the first deputy foreign minister was here wanting us to end the, you know, and to make sure that there is no further uh, deterioration of situation. I'm talking from their point of view. From, right. You, know, you mean no yeah. deterioration on the West? On the West. And from their point of view, they didn't want India to uh, take more territories and others on the West, I that's think. Correct. That's you correct. Know, because this was, when the conflict had begun. Because, conflict had begun. because this was limited to the East. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. So just to go back before the conflict began, uh, you remember there is um, a, a, a widely held view that Sam Manikshaw, the, uh, our army chief, in April 71, advised the prime minister not to take any precipitate action. And I understand from Shekhar's book that actually it was certain cabinet colleagues of hers who wanted her to undertake military action as early as April 1971. And she herself, as you have rightly pointed out, wanted to prepare the diplomatic ground abroad before doing anything so precipitate as a military action. And therefore, she got Sam Manikshaw and his views to get her recalcitrant cabinet colleagues to hold their horses and not press her to take any uh, overt military action so early. Is that correct in your opinion? Well, I'll tell you one thing, uh, that General Sam Manisha is one of our most celebrated soldiers, and we need to salute a man like him every day. And yes. so what is, but in this case, I think the situation, as a shrewd leader, Mrs. Gandhi was very fortunate that she had advice of some of the leading people, uh, not only of the time, but of all time. She had P.N. Haksad's advice. She had uh, the advice of D.P. Dhar. She had uh, the advice of R.N. Kao. She had the advice of General Sam Manakshaw. And in addition, the other two service chiefs, you know, because for the first time, the there was coordination between Army, Navy, and Air Force. Right. So what I will tell you in response to your question is that it, if we, I was on the U.S. desk and never once in, in April uh, or, or March, the Americans come, they would come and complain, oh, you are attacking. Never once was there an attack, complain that you are attacking. Right. You know, at that time. That came later. The crucial speech of Mrs. Gandhi's the word is date is May 21. In May 21. when she said when she said that Pakistan's security problem is now becoming India's security problem. So thereafter, 
that the things change. See, so it is the combined heroism and combined effort of our glorious armed forces and uh, the great inspiration provided by our political leadership, who was rightly, the Prime Minister was rightly called the Durga and the Empress of India, and all her great advisors, amongst whom we would include you, Sati, as the junior as level. All of, the all of you are involved. But I would say that yes. I was especially a word to the veterans that it is their day. Yes. We are celebrating the, the, the hard work that they did. And on behalf of all of us, a hearty congratulations to them. And Absolutely. we do hope uh, and we have full faith in how they can defend the country in the future. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Sati. Thank